Hello and welcome to episode 13. Not sure why we're finishing on episode 13, but that's how it's worked out. Of um, In Isolation, UKC's competition climbing chat show. Charlie Bosco here with Natalie Berry and Mike Langley alongside me as ever. And this is just a bit of a wrap-up show, really. Um, isolation really being lifted. Uh, Mike not looking his usual dapper self because he's actually putting in a day's graft. And like Natalie and I, the desk jockeys, the castle climbing wall where Mike works, reopening. Um, attempting, attempting, yeah. Attempting to open, yeah. Um, isolation and, and lockdown seemingly coming to an end. Um, I'm a bit of a pessimist. I think this might just be series one of in isolation with series yeah. two coming when wave two hits, but uh, we'll stay optimistic for now. Um, and we thought we'd just run through some, some highlights of the 12 um, episodes we've filmed. Um, who wants to go first? Natalie, who, who's been... Uh, Standout guest, standout quote. Yeah, I think it's got to be Adam Ondra just for his enthusiasm for climbing. I think we could have had like a six hour episode with him. I think he loves talking about climbing just as much as he loves doing it. So, yeah, just to hear him talk about the combined format and how he combines rock climbing with competitions is really insightful. In the end, I, I was thinking like I, I was confident that the Holland hand gym would be so good that I could like wave the crowd or something. Like in my mind, I was making thinking even maybe I will just try to campus it and like <laughs> wave to the crowd that like one hour lock off. But in the end, I was like being a little more conservative and just do the ball to the top. Did you know that the other guys would struggle so much on the hand jams? Uh, before the finals, I would think that there will be at least somebody who knew how to do the hand jam. But like those guys, they had even no idea like what what you should do with the th with your hand. They were thinking like it's more about the fingers and it's not about the thumb. It was like literally they had no idea. I was nice enough that I was like trying to like explain them in the isolation. But yet at the same time, you know, if it was like the easiest hand jam in the world, maybe it would work. But it was not the easiest hand jam. It was good, but it was kind of like getting more narrow inside. So you really had to be like little, like knowing what you should do. I can't believe you told them how to do it. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I think it's amazing. Every time I've spoken to him and I went over, I did some work with him in the Czech Republic and I was over in his hometown in Brno and we go out for dinner always says something where I just think how have I not known that how have I got to this stage of my climbing career and not known that and he just he think it seems like he just thinks about everything at a, a level that most of us can't really get to his, it, the depth of his thinking is amazing I think that standout point for me from Adam's interview, just talking about how psyched he was there, Natalie, was I think we asked basically, do you ever go to the climbing gym like a lot of us and just sort of get there and not you're not really got any energy and you just sit around having a having a tea and a cake? And he basically said, No, that never happens. I just I just rest and then when I go there I just want to rip the holes off the wall every single time. <laughs> and that's partly probably why he's so good. It's it's just that psych is unbelievable. Yes, yeah, it, it just going off on a tangent slightly, I've talked to a couple of members of Team Slovenia about, oh, isn't Janja a mutant? And a couple of people said to me, no, she's not a mutant. You go to the wall and you get why she's so good. She, mm -hmm. When she goes to the wall, she's going to war. And uh, I think Adam's probably a bit the same. It, often these people that seem mysteriously good, it's not that much of a mystery after all. Two people, I suppose, that will always be linked in a way, and you probably like hearing that, is um, Jamie Cassidy and Adam Ondra after the... Uh, the the crack in the Myring and final that he, well, Jamie set and Adam Adam climbed. Um, that was a fun interview with Jamie. Yeah, I think we didn't really expect that much from him. We weren't sure how much he'd say, but when we put him on, he was quite a surprise, really. He was just going off on one about root setting and how, how they managed to come up with the crack and like the behind the scenes, really, of root setting, which you don't get to see. The smallest differences. Ooh and play a huge amount into the result of the competition and obviously you've been route setting for a very long time and climbing at a high level but ultimately there has to be a, a little bit of a slice of luck in the game as well totally uh, you could have put that that whole comp uh, a month later and it might have been a disaster 
with this with the same field who they might have just travelled to five five comps, be tired, be a little bit injured. And it's the one thing about route setting at World Cups. It, it's it's a total estimation. Mm. Uh, and you set during the week, make your adjustments and you plan, and then you have to adjust the the correct way I think. Well, the way I do it is I have the hardest version that I'm ever going to need premeditated. So I'm only ever making something easier. Tonde, about his route setting, the interview we did with him, there's many, many emotional points to talk to about with him. But just going back to what you said about um, Adam Ondra and Jamie Cassidy there, even in Tonde's interview, many interviews down the line, he was even talking about the crack climbing May Ring. And it's just... It's just it's just such an incredible story in many ways because of what he described as one of the most basic and fundamental styles within climbing, hand jamming, causing such a storyline. Um, and that was a really well put point there amongst many others from Tonde. But you mentioned Tonde. He was amazing. Um, I, I knew him kind of, I knew who he was, but uh, when you meet someone that is so much more articulate, intelligent, informed than you are, you just get a bit of an education I felt like I got a bit of an education that day I yeah. um, haven't had many interviews kind of as challenging but rewarding as that mm. I liked how he kind of flipped the questions around and didn't just give us straight answers he kind of deconstructed them and yeah taught us all the things it was really nice to tackle a couple of the more difficult uh, issues of the time as well and and issues that were probably unfortunately continue for a long time but it was good to just move away from some of the World Cup chat a little bit just to get into some of those difficult conversations um, like we had with Campbell Harrison um, and with Tonde and I felt like that was a really nice little transition and showed how, how deep and inclusive the climbing community really can be and that was that was nice to hear. What have your experiences well, think, been of people in climbing and how it relates to the rest of the world? Um, I mean by and large you know uh, I feel like climbing is one of the, like, the greatest gifts for me. Um, I tell, when I teach root setting courses, for instance, instance, I remind root setters that climbing changed my life, like literally. I, it changed my career, it changed who I am. It changed the places I traveled to, you know, and helped me discover and learn what the world was. Um, uh, I traveled to uh, an example I often give is uh, Red River Gorge, Kentucky, one of the you know great world climbing areas. Um, it was a long time ago, but traveling to Kentucky uh, as a black person, uh, young, I was in my like early twenties, maybe or yeah, mid yeah early twenties, um, listening to rap music and like oh yeah, America's cool, black music, you know this is my culture. I went there and I saw poor white people and I experienced their lives and saw their perspective, effectively people who are Trump electors and um, interacting, seeing the people, seeing the conditions they live in, you understand a lot better what's happening in the world. But Mike, you mentioned then about the um, climbing community. One person I think we should mention in, in all this was um, Stasha. She got so emotional talking about how much she missed the community. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think um, we've worked with Stasha quite up. a bit. And um, it, 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 yeah, she's just amazing. And the stories that she told were were, like, were very emotional, like you say. And um, she really just lives those moments again and again. And she's even moved to Munich where she had that European Championship win. And like I said, every, every point we just went into this epic story. And it was superb just to see... Um, kind of her way of thinking about her family and how the competitions affect her whole life in general. And I have to say that was my favourite interview. Yeah, I think she's been through so much with her injuries and you could tell that she'd been out of the competition scene for so long that even just a Zoom video chat with us was kind of a little connection back into the little competition world. So of all your other wins and podium places, what else stands out? <sighs> European Cup, uh, Championship Munich, absolutely the highlight of my career so far. That tension, that spirit of the Munich Olympia Stadium and all the people that are there. Um, it's just something I really 
dream about every year being at that stadium. Now that I trained in Munich for this 10 or eight months, every time I pass by this, all the emotions come back. Like it happened several times that I just stand there and start crying out of mixed emotions, missing everything and just standing there imagining the crowd in that exact field where the wall usually is. It's something special for me and that's also why I moved here. Um, yeah, I think she really enjoyed it and it was nice to see someone actually get something out of the interview, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was, there's a bit of couple. That one, Tonde and Adam, I think, um, where you just, I kind of felt floored afterwards. Mm. Got a cold beer out of the fridge and you go and sit in the garden <laughs> and just go. Yeah. Just, I also so, really liked Kyra's as well. I think one of her quotes about Oh yeah, I developed my front on powerful climbing style because it hurts less than climbing normally <laughs> because of her scoliosis. That was that just put it into perspective how what she has to deal with really when she's climbing. Yeah, that was amazing. I think there's a lot of a lot of the neutrals um, mm-hmm. rooting for Kyra uh, in the Olympics, but we'll see. But uh, generally, for me, it's just been nice to feel like you're still part of it. I think we're all kind of um, stuck away. In, in your houses a bit and um, it's it feels a long time ago and it feels a long way away being part of um, the World Cups and, and the scene. I've just, I think it's been nice to kind of remind yourself that all those people that you're used to seeing every week are still out and about. And, but turning uh, away from what a great job we've done over the last 12 weeks um, to the Olympic predictions, um, Matthew, you may have corresponded mm. a little bit about this Mike and I have talked about it um informally um we've still got some slots to be allocated yeah. um continentals let's go let's go Europe first uh, theoretically in Moscow in December it was also theoretically in March then June then October so um <laughs> kind of believe it when we get there but um yeah Europe up first who do we who do we fancy there one, oh, so I should just point out by the way to the viewers, only one male and one female slot available. Only the winner. Mm. Um, I think goes. I'll put my money on Sasha for the women's and for the men's Yene Kruda. Um, I just think Sasha wants it so badly and she's been injured and in some ways she might not have the same level of pressure as people who've been you know, fighting for it at all the other opportunities. She might just see it as second chance. She might as well just give it a go and she might just make it. Um, yeah, Nekruda has come very close a couple of times. And in the men's as well, you've got Germany, France and Italy, all full quota. So it's quite hard to predict which other countries will you know, give their first or second place away. And I think it'll be a Slovenian, probably Yerni. <laughs> With so much riding on the European Championships, that win, you have to win to go to the Olympics. Uh, you do wonder how much the sports psychology is going to start playing into that competition, mm-hmm. especially with the roll of the dice of the speed runs as well. We heard from Will Bosey just saying anything can really happen after the speed. Um, but he he was backing himself as well, which was good to hear. Good to see that positive attitude saying, yeah, I think I, think I can do it. Um, but for one person to go through it, it's a really brutal format now. Yeah, I think I think with all these continentals, they're all a huge lottery. I mean, even if Yanni was taking part in the women's, you'd still say mm, it's it's it is a lottery. But I'll, I'll, I'll go with Stasha as well for yeah. the women. I just she's an academic. Yeah, so, she's got lots going on. I don't know whether she'll go again in four years or what. I'm mm-hmm. not saying she won't. I don't know what her plans are. I think this is a good opportunity. Um, I think the other thing with Stash is that she's really good at one-off events, like championship events. She just seems to pull it out the bag. So she's probably got a good mental game going on. Yeah, I'll go with Stash. I'll go, I'll go with Will Bosey in the men. Why not? I, I like Will. He's got the horsepower. Um, and someone's got to win it. So, But I think Crudo will be a, a big challenge. Um, Oceana, not as many climbers that we know, but... Um, mm-hmm. Natalie, any, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, it'd be really nice to see the two guests that we had on our show, Oceana and Campbell. Um, I think you'd be hard pushed to beat them, really. The odds on favourites. And yeah, I think everyone considers them to be the ones to watch, even if they themselves are very modest about it in the interviews. 
yeah, Campbell was saying, don't don't make this down to a one horse race. He he named a whole bunch of chaps there that he's going to be up against. And again, the same situation plays in. If your odds on favourite, imagine what the pressure is on that. That this is your possibly one chance to go to the Olympics it comes down to three disciplines in one day. It's again, it's just brutal and a good one to watch. I'm looking forward to it. Let's hope let's hope it goes ahead. Yeah, I hope so. Um it's going to be in Sydney, isn't it? Um, I, I think Oceana, pretty clear favourite on the women's side, but I know Tiff Melius and a couple of other of the Aussie climbers have really been pouring their heart and soul into training for it, so not a foregone conclusion. I think the men's is actually a little more open. I think uh, Ben Abel's got a big result in him. Uh, Campbell might not have things all his own way, but I, I agree that they're probably, if I had to put my... I, won't, I was about to say my mortgage. I wouldn't want to put my mortgage on anyone in the combined, but... Uh, um, I think you're probably right. I think, yeah, Oceana and Campbell are probably the favourites, but wouldn't surprise me if it didn't quite go that way. Um, up next, uh, Africa. This is a tricky one. I don't know many African climbers. I'm willing to hold my hand up. Yeah, The win at those uh, like selection event for the Africa Cup recently, well, not that recently, back in January, and the winners were Erin Sterkenberg and Christopher Cossa. So... Seems likely that they're, if they're winning a qualifier event, they should be in good stead for getting the ticket. But who knows? I think the field in Africa would be a lot more open than in Europe, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, at the Youth World Championships in Arco last year, there's a couple of um, handy-looking South Africans, but I don't feel qualified to say who the standout performers will be. But... Um, I'm interested to see that because we're probably going to get someone at the Olympics who we'll be frantically trying to find out some information for before uh, we get underway. So uh, that'll be an interesting comp. And don't forget as well that we've got the uh, Asian Championships as well with Japan having filled their quota and nobody else, if memory serves me right. Two Chinese, but one male, one female. So. Yeah. Are we saying John Wan Chong for the men? I think so. Yeah. He's come really close. There a bit of a storyline is there as well because it all got a bit confused a couple of months ago. Um, well, it feels like a couple of months ago now mm. with John Wan uh, Chong John and uh, Che Yun Sir saying, coming out saying that they're, they've gone back to the Hatchoji result and then it's gone a bit back and forth. And I, I feel like I've lost touch now with exactly <laughs> what's mm. going on. It's been. It's been, um, I hesitate yeah. to say messy, messy, but it's it's not been the cleanest way through to the Olympics. No. Chance would be a good story, though, if she made it. Yeah. I would um, put the put the cat amongst mm. Yanya's pigeons. I just don't know um, what she's like in speed. Um, I think she can certainly win lead and maybe do quite well in bouldering, but I'm not sure she's quite up to speed, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah. But again... The speed is so unpredictable that she might just make it. Yeah, um, and looking forward to the Olympics themselves, albeit as we've uh, outlined, we don't know everyone that's going to be there. The Olympics, to me, feel like they're going to be a lot more open than we originally thought because um, because of Corona and what's that done? That's done to people's uh, ability to train how they want, their ability to get sharp in competitions. People are almost certainly going to be comp rusty next year they won't have they won't have done as many events as they would have done had the season gone ahead as normal um anyone want to have a punt at a podium well i would say um just covering the men's competition like you said charlie it's a little bit un unpredictable now with such a, an additional training gap in between you feel like there is a chance for a bolter to come through the ranks somebody potentially young who could could could, could blast it over the next year however you'd be hard pressed to go against the the Jakob Samoa Andra kind of trio up the top there. I think that's, I mean, if the cream always rises to the top, to steal your phrase from a few months ago, um, those are three are surely the cream in the men's competition. Yeah, plus yeah. one. I'll go, for, I'll go for that as a podium. Yeah, I think I was a bit concerned about Jakob in lockdown because he didn't seem to have the same facilities that some of the other climbers have had. But Incredibly, he just seems to be climbing 9A straight out of lockdown and looking really strong on rock. So I'm sure he'll be back to his usual self really quickly in competition. 
Yeah, I think him and Misha Pekoroaz had a fingerboard mm. nailed to the branch of a tree in Innsbruck, but Jakob <laughs> still managed to climb 9A. So, well, if this was going to say, if this is Jakob in unfit form, his video from Magic Wood <laughs> the other day was absolutely mind blowing. Um, yeah. how, how fit he must be to do that many hard boulders in a day was incredible. Yeah, very impressive, I should say. I mean, he's he's not old, but he's getting old by the standards of competition climbers. It's nearly 10 years since that season when he won all but one lead World Cup and still psyched out of his box for training, for boulders, for roots. For... Yeah. I, I'm, I'll say Jakob for the win, seeing as neither of you two committed to an order on the podium. Yeah. Um, what do we think in the women? Anyone going to say that Jan is not going to win it? I think she's going to win it. And I think she's also had a really good lockdown. Like Slovenia was one of the first countries that declared the epidemic over in the country. And they've had a lot of time on the wall, a lot of time bouldering and getting the movement skills back up. Um, and I think she's got her own speed wall or her own lead wall in her backyard or somewhere. So I think she'll be really well prepared. I think the only thing that concerns me is that her head game might just collapse if she starts to feel too much pressure. And we keep talking about her too much. Speaking of head games, because it's obviously in, in Tokyo, the Japanese team, uh, especially Akio and Miho, so much pressure from the home crowd. And, and there has been results in the past where the, the Japanese team have crumbled a little bit under that home pressure. So I think it could either play into their hands or or have the absolute opposite effect. Yeah, Akio looked pretty handy in the World Championships uh, last year. I think she was, if she'd held the top hold on the combined lead route, she would have won the combined World Championship. Um, albeit I think she knew she'd done what she needed to do so um, mm. it was a slightly different situation but um, I think it'll be Miho and Akio uh, mm. on the podium with Yanya certainly Akio, Miho depends on the shoulders mm. um, so, there's, so we, there's also the heat to take into account because it's going to be so hot it's going to be the same time that it was planned for this year middle of August and yeah, I know Adam's been preparing for it well, but yeah, hopefully the others will too. And maybe that's a home advantage for the Japanese if they're used to it. Yeah, I think um, obviously Mike and I were there last year um, for the World Championships in August and it is so hot and humid. I really can't overstate. Um, I went for a run on Mount Takao and got lost and um, before one of the live streams, only just made it onto the live stream, having got back to the station and everything. And I downed a two litre bottle of water and still during the stream, my hand kept going like this and the dehydration. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, it was th two or three days before I felt all right again. Um, it is, the, the humidity is, is sapping in August in Japan. Um, uh, I do think it gives the Japanese climbers a bit of an advantage, to be honest, because uh, the heat is not like that in Europe. It's not really like that in most of the States. Um, even in, I mean, maybe in Florida and Texas, but generally the climbers don't climb outside in those conditions, um, even the climbers that live there. So, yeah, I think the heat's going to give the Japanese a bit of an advantage. I fancy Akio and uh, Miho for the, for the podium. Um, just turning our attention now towards uh, competitions and the resumption of competitions, the IFSC have released um, a calendar. We are getting underway in the uh, last 10 days of August in, in Briançon. Um, Natalie, you wrote a piece about this for UKC. Huge list of protocols in the IFSC about how competitions are going to be run in the, in the corona era. Um, what's, what, what are the kind of headlines from that for you? Yeah, I think the main change, like most of it was just basic hygiene stuff that we're all used to, you know, going to the supermarket, washing your hands, wearing masks. Um, but the main thing that stood out was that there, was, there won't be a warm-up wall anymore. It'll just be bring your own portable fingerboard, pull up some scaffolding or something. Um, and that's a major change, I think, especially for lead climbing, because you really you use the warm-up wall to kind of get your brain tuned into movements, to get rid of flash pump. And it's really hard to do that on fingerboards. But I do think that the athletes have had quite a lot of practice at home just fingerboarding warming up for like one panel of wall um they might be slightly more adapted to that now than they were pre-corona but yeah it's certainly a big thing to adapt to um especially when a lot of competition comes down to routine and 
doing the same things over again. So I think the first couple of competitions will definitely be a bit of a shock to the system. I wonder how those teams with the biggest budgets might be able to use this to their advantage as well, knowing that you've only got, like you say, a scaffold board in the warm-up area. I wonder what they can do. Can they can they, can they have a fold-out wall on the back of the van, the team <laughs> van? Can they persuade the owner of the nearest Airbnb to put a massive circuit board in the garden? You know, what can they, what can they do to, to give themselves that edge? Um, and importantly, trying to avoid injury if the warm-up facilities are next to none. I mean, it's been a bit of a talking point. I don't think we've got long enough to go into it now, but it's um, a, a tough decision for the IFSC guys out there at the moment to try and get competitions underway under such difficult circumstances and, and no less tricky for the athletes to actually be able to perform. It's going to be really tricky as well if um, things don't go exactly according to plan. I mean, one of the things mentioned is if there's a positive coronavirus test, um, there'll be a decision made about whether the comp can go ahead. I think even even when the comps run, it's, it's still going to be really weird. And I, I think um, we'll still be wondering what's going to happen an hour before the final. I think it's going to be, everyone's going to be living or walking around slightly on eggshells, just sort of nervously thinking, well, in theory, we've got the final in an hour, but I saw one of the route setters go to get a coronavirus test and you know how rumors spread in the climbing world. Um, so I think uh, it could be a really strange vibe of never quite being sure when you wake up the next day whether there'll still be a competition to continue. But um, I think one, one interesting element of this is how do you think the climbers – um, have taken to this news and athlete do you think the climbers will all want to attend these World Cups or will some of them just say it's not worth the risk um, I'll just wait until things are better yeah not naming any names I've definitely seen a few comments on social media saying I'm not going to it. it's not even a World Cup it's more risk than it's worth um, you know it's quite a lot of money um, a lot of the events are in Asia there's one in the USA um, that's quite a lot of money to spend on going to a competition that might not happen or might make your entire team get ill um, so it is a big risk and I know there's definitely more than a handful of athletes who aren't 100% committed to the events just yet. Um, I would say on the flip side though there has been some positive social media posts as well when the calendar got calendar got released there was a number of athletes again naming no names just saying yeah your competition's back on can't wait to get back out there um so well we'll see when start this gets announced yeah i mean stasha was psyched obviously yeah, i saw that <laughs> i saw it um i just think i think it'll be interesting um who chooses to go who chooses not to go how rusty people look will the root testers have the first idea how hard to make the roots Will we be able to adhere to these protocols? What will it be like having no crowd? Brianne Son, Mike and I have, have done it. Natalie, you've been, you've got that massive field full of 8,000 people. Yeah. Brilliant atmosphere, almost festival atmosphere. And assume um, just either silence or um, the standard competition diet of bad Euro pop blasting out the speakers, yeah. uh, but with no crowd to drown it out. It could be a really strange feeling. Yeah, I've competed in one competition, the Quiff, with no crowd, and they had like canned laughter and canned <laughs> applause, and it was really strange. Um, I think that will definitely affect how hard the athletes push. Like it can have such a massive impact psychologically, and if there's just the organisers and maybe 10 people, I think it will dramatically change the atmosphere. I'm interested to see what it's like anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, Charlie, I don't think it will change much from a viewer's perspective on the live stream. I, I watched that, that Quiff event on the live stream um, back in March, Natalie, and, and honestly, you couldn't really tell the difference yeah. um, because you don't get loads of crowd ambient noise in a broadcast anyway, uh, rightly or wrongly. But um, I think from a viewer's perspective, the action on the wall is what's important. And maybe this is an opportunity to try a few new things with the sound as well. Well, for, everyone would be really relieved to know they'll still be able to hear you and me, Mike. That's mm. just, don't worry, everyone at home is probably sweating about yeah. that. Um, no, I've even more listeners. I, I, get, <laughs> I uh, yeah, they won't be able to drown us out at all, and just be Mike and I coming heavy through your speakers. Um, but I've got I've got a bit of practice. We've got the Austrian um, climbing mm. summer series coming up. 
my first look at um, a coronavirus competition. There's been a lot of talk about that. I mean, normally the Austrian Climbing Championships, I went last year just as a spectator and just sat there um, drinking a beer in the crowd. Going to be a, bit, a lot of um, attention on it this year, which it hasn't been before. And that could be quite interesting. They've got the Swiss and German athletes involved as well, or a few people, like an invitational. So it's not just Austrian competitors. So it should be quite interesting to watch. Yeah, they've got four four per country, per discipline, per gender, per discipline, per country. Yeah. Um, and we've got the, the... So there's two identical competitions in July uh, and then uh, Boulder competitions and then two in lead in, um, in August. So I, I might... I'll, I'll see if I can write something up for UKC about what it was yeah. like, any big takeaways. Um, got Anna Stur helping me out as well. Hey, you um, Yeah, doing? exactly, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't want to say an upgrade from Mike. Um, <laughs> Certainly won a few more world championships. <laughs> between don't you. Don't put yourself down. Yeah, exactly. 22 <laughs> World Cup wins between you and Anna. I mean, it's <laughs> not to be sniffed at. Um so yeah, it'll be really interesting. My first look at the, at the coronavirus competitions. Um, first time back on the horse since LA in February. I'm very nervous. And we're going out on Austrian TV as well. So yeah, yeah. we'll share it on UKC as well. <laughs> the live stream. Just have to hope I can still remember which end of the mics are talking to. <laughs> um, but uh, something to look forward to anyway. Comps are back. It's it's Thursday now, so we're um, we're back uh, a week today competition climbing resumes so yeah that seems a logical place to leave in isolation for now hopefully there's not a series two but, uh, but yeah. thanks <laughs> thanks to both of you for all your work over the over the past 12 weeks and i hope everyone ho at uh, home has enjoyed it yeah and, thanks um, guys as well from uk yeah hopefully we'll <laughs> um, you'll be hearing us on the live streams before too long yeah